Yeah, we're ready. <laughs> nice. All right, welcome everyone. Thanks for coming. We are not Ryan Knight. Um, Ryan Knight unfortunately got sick, so we're filling in for him. So I'm James Ward from TypeSafe. I'm a developer advocate there. And we have with us as well. I'm, I'm Josh Surrett from TypeSafe. Uh, I'm a senior software developer and uh, lead of the tools team. Great. So this session is on effective Akka. So we're going to start out with a little intro to Akka for those of you that aren't familiar with it. How many people here have used Akka before? Cool. Okay. So we'll start with an intro for those of you that haven't, and then we'll dive into some best practices and things that you can do to use Akka more effectively. So with that, let's do it. So we want to start out by talking about why Akka, why does it matter? So there's this thing uh, that's emerging called the reactive web, and there's some tenets of reactive. So reactive is event-driven, resilient, scalable, and responsive, and it's also hipster. So um, we're not going to go into a lot of details on what reactive is and the tenets of reactive. We co-created, or RCTO co-created, something called the Reactive Manifesto, which really goes into a lot of detail on these tenants and talks about them in a technology agnostic way. So if you want to learn how to be a hipster in the reactive web, uh, then check out the Reactive Manifesto. You can sign it. There's over 2,000 signa signatures now uh, on the, the Reactive Manifesto. So I encourage you to check that out. But that's really what Akka is about, is it's about creating this foundation that allows us to build reactive software. So let's talk a little bit about actors. I'll hand it over to Josh. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> Akka is designed completely around actors. Actors are essentially things that handle messages um, and contain state and identity. Um, they're kind of like objects, uh, but a little bit different in how they deal with concurrency. Um, if you were to take objects and actually tie concurrency to them, you would end up with actors. In that, an actor can only handle one message at a time, it can update its state effectively, but you don't really have to lock ever, even though you're supporting multiple threads, because um, <clears throat> you can only handle one message at a time. So one method call, essentially. Um, yeah, and actors usually have many actors. They say that um, one actor is no actor, and so actors come in systems. And so even though an actor can only process one message at a time, the way that you would do concurrency is to have multiple actors. And so these actors can be anything living any amount of time. So oftentimes uh, in a web application, a good thing to do in an actor is something that lives beyond just the request response cycle. So in a lot of web applications, the typical thing that uses a thread is a request comes in and a response goes out. And actors are, uh, you can certainly use actors for that, but actors are really good when you have life cycles that are either larger than that or smaller than that. Uh, and so that can really vary in size and, and length of duration. Yeah, and the, the key then, when you're using an actor system, if you want to scale it either up or out, the way that you do so is by creating more actors. The more actors you have, the more potential parallelism you have, and the easier it is to take your actors and fragment them across machines and things. Since everything is message driven, you get a lot of nice properties from that. So, what actors are not? You might hear a lot of comparisons. So actors are not agents. They are not message-driven beings. They're not observer-listener things. They are not threads, and it's not you know JMS. Um, we can go through the differences here between actors and those things, but uh, I would just say if you see a comparison that where someone's like actors are just JMS, or actors are just message-driven beings, that's actually completely wrong. JMS is a mechanism of communicating across processes, right, across servers. Actors could be completely on a single machine, completely in the same process, and never have a message get sent outside of your process. And they will work great, and they will scale up, right? There are not threads in that a single actor is not a thread. Uh, actors can be shared across threads, and they can move across your CPU just like threads can. Um, they are not observers or listeners. They are not um, message-driven beings are a lot different in that a message-driven being has a fan out where you have many of these things that handle messages as they come in. Actors are not like that. An actor handles one message at a time and every message destined for a particular identity goes to the same actor. If you want to fan out, you have to explicitly create an actor which fans things to other actors. Okay? There's a, there's a big difference here. 
So let's go into an example. Yeah, so I want to show you how to get started building applications with Akka. We have something at TypeSafe called TypeSafe Activator. What it is is a tool to get started building applications, building reactive applications with the TypeSafe platform. So that includes PlayFramework, Akka, and Scala. So to, to, uh, to get Activator, you can just go to TypeSafe.com, download it, or you can come by the TypeSafe booth, and, uh, and we'll give you a bottle opener uh, USB drive with Activator on it. So once you get that zip file, you extract it, and then you run Activator. You can either run Activator in a command line mode or in a UI mode. It's up to you, whichever one you're more comfortable with. So I've started Activator here in the UI mode, and now I can create a new application. So I'm going to use this Hello Akka template. There's a lot of different templates in Activator, and you can choose any of those to get started with. Some of them have Akka, some of them don't, uh, so a, a large variety. But I'm going to choose the Hello Akka one, and I'm just going to create an application with that template. So now it's going to go out and it's going to get the dependencies for that application and then compile that application, uh, and then we'll see the, the Activator UI for, for managing this application. So Activator is a local running web application. It allows us to, uh, to do all this in our browser, but it runs locally. You know, we've thought about running it on the cloud at some point, but for now, it's just a, a local running web application. And of course, it's all built in Play Framework, Akka, and Scala. Uh, so in Activator, we're now in this application, and we can see there's a tutorial. So every template in Activator comes with a tutorial that will walk us through the code. We can navigate into the code for, uh, for the project here and walk through all the different steps of the tutorial. I'll let you guys do that for, for homework tonight. Uh, and so now we can actually see the code for this actor application. Uh, so I want to walk through the, the code just so you can get an idea for how we build actors. And before we do that, I want to show you a little bit more of Activator. In Activator, we can see the compile output. We can see the test output, so we see if our tests are pass or failing. Uh, and we can see the run output. So you'll see this particular application, it just keeps on outputting hello type safe over and over and over again. I can restart the application. I can also start the TypeSafe console, which allows me to visualize my actor system and my play application. So definitely check that out. We uh, won't have time to go into that today. But let's go through some of the code here for this particular application. So what I have in this application is uh, a public class, hello, Akka Java. And then I have a few classes here that are really just there to, to be my message classes. So every time we talk to an actor, we're going to do it by sending it a message. And so we encapsulate these messages into classes. So now I have some descriptive classes that are going to become my messages that I use to communicate with this actor. Then I have a greeter, and this is my actor. You'll see that I'm extending untyped actor. Uh, so now in my onReceive method, uh, this is where I receive a message. You'll see that the type of message that I'm receiving is an object, and now I can look at that object, that message object, and determine now what the actor should do. So every time we send a message to the actor, that actually will go into a mailbox, and then when we can get a thread and take that message and give it to the actor, and the actor can process that, then it's going to come into the onReceive uh, on handler, and then we're going to do something with the message. So I'm saying, all right, if the message is who to greet, then what I'm going to do is set my greeting to hello, and then I'm going to get the, the who out of that message and set that there. And then if the message is greet, then I'm going to get the sender. So they're, uh, in an actor system in Akka, we know who the sender is, who sent the message, so I can get the, that actor. And then tell means send a message. And then I'm sending it a new message, which is a greeting. And then I set the sender of that to be myself. What's interesting about get sender and get self is these are references to actors. And we never, when we work with actors, we never actually work with the instances of the actors. We always work with a reference to the actor. And we'll talk about why that matters in a little bit. But this is what really provides us resiliency uh, in, our, in our applications. So then you can see the main application down here is just uh, setting up a few things and, and creating our actor. If we want to create an actor in the actor system, we say system, actor of, tell it which actor to create. And I get back in actor ref. And then down here, when I want to send that actor a message, again, I'm doing a tell to send it a message. And uh, so then we can see it's setting up some handlers for when it get, gets messages back. Uh, so that's a simple application with, with uh, Java and with Akka for, for doing actors. There's also in this example a Scala example. I'm not going to go through the code, but if you want to on your own, explore that inside of Activator. 
So that's our quick little intro to actors with Akka and getting started with Activator. Anything to clarify? Or? I, think, I think that it should say hello DevOx instead of hello type safe. It should say it, that's, yeah. So let's, let's, go, let's go fix that. So instead of saying hello type safe, let's change that to DevOx. So in Activator, I can make some small edits. I can also open this project in Eclipse or IntelliJ. And then what you see is happening is it's actually re recompiling and retesting my application. So it looks like my test passed. And then I should be able to, did I change the wrong type I think, there? I think you changed it right after the output popped up. Oh, did I? Oh, thank you. Thank you. We owe you a beer. That's, let's go change the right file this time. Hello. Devox, save, and then it will recompile. And if we got any compilers, it would tell us there. And then once that recompiles, it'll automatically rerun uh, this. And now we should see. Let's restart. There we go. Hello, Devox. Cool. So, well, hello. Well, right. hello. Hello, so, Devox. Uh, yeah. Let's uh, let's head into the next. Um, oh, is that wrong? No, that was right. That was right. So uh, the first rule of using actors is that everything should remain asynchronous. Everything, okay? Um, in, this, in the system that you saw, there was, there was communication going back and forth, okay? Uh, in the Scala API, instead of using .tel, you can use bang. Um, I actually prefer .tel somewhat. Um, I, I still don't like the name tel, but bang is, bang is cool. Some did that like come bang. from like Erlang or something? It did come from Erlang. Okay. So that's where our history comes from. That's the API and the, the language that you know, originally had actors. So anyway, you, you, you bang messages. And then question mark is send a message and wait for a response. Okay? That's a pattern in, a, in the Scala API. It's actually pretty nice. There's also a method called ask that you can use external to an actor that will give you a future response. Okay, so the response, that method returns immediately, and then you can do other things, and when that future is done, you can eventually do something. The idea here is to use actors effectively. Do not block on messages. Send a message, and then a response will come later. There's a lot of tenets to this. That await at the bottom, that you can await for a future result, is bad. That looks ugly in Scala and Java code in the API for a reason, because we don't want you to use it. There are times where you have to use it, and that's, that's OK. There's going to be times, right? Um, so it's there. But avoid it as often as you possibly can, because it will allow your system to scale better. As long as things are asynchronous and communicating on that, you can allow the uh, thread pool scheduler, fork join, to optimize the execution of your code across all your CPUs. If you're not doing that, then you're not giving it a chance to optimize because you're taking back control. And so those points usually become choke points in your app. Is it OK if I use await.result in my tests? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's OK if you use await.result in your tests. Um, I don't know if there's a, there, there might be some, a few testing frameworks where that's not even necessary. That'd be cool. Yeah. yeah. How would you know when your tests are done? Yeah. <laughs> Because there's a future that completes. <laughs> right. Yeah. True. Yeah. The good build point. tool is the thing that has to block. Ah. Anyway. <laughs> <coughs> so um, related, related to that uh, is that your actors are actually stateful. Okay? They actually have state in them. And uh, we can actually use this to simulate state machines in actors. Um, I would say that they, they pretty much are state machines. So you can do some neat things. For example, uh, here's, here's a pattern. You know, I have a, a query service or something. I have some service where people are performing actions. Uh, but a lot of the responses are really the same. They're always the same. So let's throw a cache in front of that actor. Why can we throw a cache in front of the actor safely that has a completely different API? Good question. <laughs> it's because, as James said, we use actor refs. Right? Since we're always talking through references, you can actually take an actor, you can change the state of this actor, and push your system further down the chain, and have a new actor that does new behavior. Um, in actor systems, it, they, they call it kind of the onion principle, where like the core actor of your system does absolutely nothing and just has people that he delegates to to do everything. And then if they fail, which we'll talk about later, you can recover. Um, this, is, this is a similar kind of concept. We're going to throw the aging query cache in front of the actual system, and we're gonna just going to change the reference we point to, and the API is the same. So, Nice. Here's, here's the code for a query cache. Assuming we have 
one message that gets sent to our service, which is, I have a query. Okay? So in the query cache, we create a new instance of the cache. That's our state right here, the cache. Uh, and in our receive method, this is the Scala API, uh, if I get a query message, I check the cache to see if I have a result for that query. If so, I send it. Um, otherwise, if I'm uncached, I call this process method, which we'll cover in a second. The other message I respond to is someone telling me, hey, go cache the result to a query. Here's the data you need to cache. And that data actually contains the query and the result. Okay? Uh, we're going to ignore what that is. But th that's, this is kind of, the nice thing about Scala code is this actually compiles and it looks like pseudocode, which is why <laughs> we're using it. Okay? All right, so uh, what we essentially are doing here is we're sending a message to the query cache actor. He's going to construct in that process call an interceptor actor. He's creating a new actor to represent the session that we are in. Then he forwards the query down to the actual service. But when we forward it in that tell method, if you remember, there was a second parameter of who sent the message. What we're doing is we're faking the return address. We're not, we don't want it to come back to the query cache. We want it to go to the interceptor. Why? Because the query cache doesn't know, he, he doesn't have state for all the different clients that are coming in, right? For a particular message, he knows who sent it. But we don't really want to remember that in the query cache. That's a little too much state. So we're actually throwing that into the interceptor, and he's going to remember that information about the session for us, and the messages will flow back to him. So when the message comes back, the interceptor will do two things. He'll tell us to update our cache with the data that we just got from the service, and he will send the result off, and then he'll disappear. That actor just is now gone because we don't need him anymore. So when we have a cache query, right, the query comes in, and we just respond directly without hitting our service anymore. So we've improved kind of performance of our system by having this guy in front of it. Great. So let's talk about resilience. So resilience is one of the tenets of reactive software. And what we're trying to do is react to failure. So on this one, uh, there's a number of different cases that could, that could cause failure. So one of these examples is that we could have something that is starving the CPU. So, uh, so we need to be able to do some kind of throt throttling. Also, we can have failures that just occur for you know, weird reasons on any thread and at any time. So we need to be able to have ways to account for these failures. So first, uh, in the actor system, we set things up in a hierarchy so that every actor has a supervisor. And the supervisor is what's responsible for making sure that this actor is going to uh, stay available and be able to continue processing messages. There's a default supervision strategy uh, in Akka that will restart the actor if it fails for some reason. So if the, if the actor dies, then the default supervisor is just going to restart it. Uh, so the supervisor, it's, it's really there to manage this failure and deal with it. So the nice thing about dealing with failure in actors is that we deal with them by having the supervisor manage the failure rather than having it take down things sequentially as it goes. So we'll uh, show an example of this in a second. Yeah, so the, the part about bubbling up is here. Uh, act, you can actually have, supervisors can also have supervisors. A supervisor is an actor. So because of that, uh, you can actually create these hierarchies where I have my very important system at the very top, and I have less important able to recover from failure systems further down and further down, even more risky systems, and I can recover from failure of things that bubble up. So in this case, if this explosion happens, it's going to bubble up to its supervisor, but the supervisor knows how to recover. So he, to recover, he's going to send a poison pill to the other actor. That's what the message is called, unfortunately. That actor disappears, and then he is going to restart his entire subcomponent, because that is the correct way for that subcomponent to recover. And after he restarts those actors and they get wired back up, he changes his state from a failure state of telling you know, messages, hey, things are broken here, to things are good again. 
right? So because you can uh, control on that entire component level, you can actually use different strategies for how to restart. You can restart the, the entire component. You can start a particular subsystem. If an actor fails, you can actually take the message that it got that caused it to fail and send it to another live component and then restart that actor. All sorts of fun things. So in our typical applications, what we have is this, this data layer that's talking to a database or something. We have some business layer on top of that and then some application layer on top of that. And what happens is that if our person DAO has a failure, then that cascades up all the way out to the user controller and to the, to the actual end user. They end up seeing some ugly exception or, uh, or it's that, that code has to be responsible for catching that exception. And the problem with this approach is that how does that controller now talk back to the thing that caused the failure? How, do, how does that happen? Usually that would create some really ugly code in our code base to have this communication going back and forth across these layers. So uh, this is obviously a bad way to do it. Uh, I think that our healthcare.gov site in the US, most of its problems come down to this particular type of architecture. Yeah, and th the key here is that you're, because the failure automatically goes up the hierarchy, you will actually send the user an error message or have it time out, okay? Um, so that the user still gets an error message, but you're going to customize that error message for the user. But actually dealing with the failure is not the responsibility of the session. It's not the responsibility of this up and down flow between stacks. When the data layer fails, I need to restore the data layer. I don't need to restore the business layer, so he doesn't need to know about that exception besides this request died, so he can recover from the session perspective, right? So that's the key. You have these two different levels of failure. You need to handle them differently. Yep. Unless you're healthcare.gov. Unless then you're healthcare. Okay. Then, yeah, you just let it fail. So you want to talk about how we do this in actors? Sure. So um, one thing that, that a way to think about this uh, for actors with the hierarchy is that if you look at your whole application topologically, you know, from a top-down design, you can actually, you know, draw boxes around pieces and pick where failures bubble up to and what components fail together. So that's what this is. This is if I have that same cer a search service with a search index, I can actually <laughs> figure out what things I want to fail together and recover together and what things need to stay alive. So in this case, the uh, overload detector on the system actually is, has to fail separately from the rest of the search service because uh, I want to I show my Twitter fail well immediately upon... Um, you know, noticing that things are timing out. I never want him to time out. I want him to be up all the time. Um, so when I do have downtime, my users don't get a broken website completely. They actually see my logo and see that I'm trying to help them, right? That's, that's better than absolutely nothing. So, yeah. Yep. So let's talk about how we actually do supervisors in Akka. Uh, so it's, it's pretty easy when you create your actor. Uh, the code that we looked at earlier didn't have uh, an explicit supervisor, so it was just using the default supervisor. But if you do want to override the supervisor with a custom one, then you can just set that when you create the actor uh, by just overriding the supervisor strategy. Yeah, and so actors themselves, um, instead of using the, si the actor system to create an actor, you, inside of another actor, you can use its context to create an actor. Anything that you create using an actor's context is supervised by you. So inside of the category actor, I can call context actor of, and then I own the actors I'm creating. Versus if I do system.actor of, the default system supervisor will own what's created. So a best practice here is in your actors, create the, your, the actors you deal with yourself and override the supervisor strategy if you care how to recover from failure. In this case, we've decided that if there's an I.O. exception, we can recover this particular actor ourselves in the search index. Categories can recover from I.O. exceptions. But if we get like a bad index exception, meaning there's some sort of problem with coherency checking across this category, we need to escalate out and down the entire index and restart it. Okay? And, and those are the decisions that you can make, and it's done via the exceptions that are thrown. So again, <laughs> using good exceptions, catching exceptions and wrapping them in higher level things is still going to be somewhat important here. Yep. All right, rule number two. Yeah, rule number, so that, that's rule number two is basically 
uh, your topology is dynamic. That topology that we showed, you can actually add actors at runtime and change the flow of it. You can take nodes and split them, uh, and you can adapt to what's happening at runtime, adapt the behavior of your actors. Yep. So here's an example. We, we showed caching before. We can actually monitor query response time of the actor system. Uh, if it's too high, we want to actually return a, a default value, kind of like the fail well. Okay, this is our, our throttling guy. Um, so here's, here's the example. We now have a throttler and a statistics service. The statistics service is separate from our throttler uh, because it can be slower. And it's going to track the general behavior of our app and decide whether or not we're in a failure state and we need to start shutting down requests because we can't handle our current pressure. So uh, when messages come in, we're actually going to create that interceptor again. We're going to create a new actor to, to handle the session state to know what's going on. Uh, and here, the interceptor becomes vitally important in the failure case. So we'll show that in a second. Anyway, the query goes down. The query comes back to the interceptor. Now, the interceptor is going to do three things, or, well, three in general things. It's going to fire an infra, you know, a message back to the user immediately, because you always want to give the user his response. It's going to send the stats to the stat service. Now the stat service has a chance to update the statistics and figure out the health of the system. If that response actually is taking a long time, it might actually tell the throttler only let you know 90% of messages through for now because we're overloaded and we need to back off some traffic. That sort of thing. So here's, here's kind of how that happens. We get another query in. What's cool about the interceptor is we can set a timeout on its receive message. So for this context, we can say, if the backend processing takes longer than so many minutes, or really, second, <laughs> if it takes more than like a second to get a response, we can have a timeout come in and hit the interceptor. The interceptor can immediately send a failure response to the user, and we can let whatever the hell is happening in the backend recover naturally while we send a, oh no, bad statistics to the stat service, and then he can decide if he needs to throttle more because we just had a full timeout. So this way your user is guaranteed a specific response time, and you can try to find ways to heal your system or expand it as time goes on. The stat service, when he decides we're in a bad state, sends the fail message to the throttler. What the throttler now can do is change the actual receive block so that it handles different code. So it yeah, so now the throttler is saying, hey, I'm not going to accept any more responses, or I'm only, only going to accept this many responses until that statistic service has some reason or some information that says that I can start you know, flowing the full number of requests through this thing. So then a, re a query comes in, and we're just going to return an error response real quickly. Yeah, so in ACA, this is known as the circuit breaker pattern. Uh, and if you need to do circuit breaking, it's actually, there, there's built-in support for this which is why we're not digging too far into the code to do it by hand. Yep. So then we can recover, and now we're back in, in to normal shape. Great, so um, those were the main patterns that we wanted to cover. Uh, so let's do a little recap on what we learned. So, the, I mean, the big thing with actors is you want to partition your state into small pieces. This is the big thing with just scaling in general. How do you scale? You make stuff small enough it can fit on a computer. You have a, you know, three terabytes of data. The only way to scale is to get that data small enough that you can work on a one machine with all the data you need. The same with actors. That's how you get scalability across your threads. Just, just partition things down. Yep. And then we always use immutable messages. Uh, this is important for, uh, for being able to send messages efficiently to actors. And uh, this makes it so that our actor systems are not moving mutable state around between actors. You definitely want to encapsulate your mutable state inside of an actor and not let that mutable state leak out in any way. Yeah, but primarily, that's about locking, too. Uh, if, if you send mutable state around, that also means you're sending a lock around, and that means that you're not allowing the system to optimize your runtime for you and schedule things appropriately. You're taking back control of the locking and the scheduling. If you need temporary state in a session, spawn an actor to keep control of it. Uh, it, it. You can actually create an actor to keep track of session across your whole app if you want and just pass down the actor ref. Uh, but if you want to track temporary s uh, data, the only way that you track state across requests is via an actor. So use an actor. 
Lastly, design as a topology. So always think about your actors in terms of actor systems and hierarchies, and this is how you set up your supervision so that you can do things like the throttling and you can handle failure and react to failure and be reactive. The last one we didn't actually have a chance to dig into too far, but you can actually partition your threads uh, on a system. You can actually also partition your cluster. Uh, and we're not, we didn't talk at all about ACA clustering, but it's the same thing. You can partition your parallelism so that, you know, I want, of my cores, I want two cores handling this set of actors and four cores handling this set of actors. You can partition your cluster to say, I want these three machines to handle my front end and these ten machines to handle my back end. Uh, and that's, that's definitely, if you think of your system in a topology and you design it that way, you can actually make these changes without changing the code, only changing the config. Yeah, and there's a really good example in Activator of doing distributed workers. So definitely, if you want to dive further into that, check out that, that uh, template in Activator. So we're actually out of time, but yeah. I'd still love to take some questions if you guys have any. Let's, um, we'll be around. So if people have questions, then, then uh, actually, let's take one question, because I don't we'll, think there's a session yeah. after this. Yeah, so we'll take one question, and then uh, I think there's beer and stuff, so we can all go out. And, uh, yeah. Cool. Anyway. Any questions? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so, uh, by de the question is, by default, if an actor crashes, it's restarted uh, with the same message sent to it. Um, I believe that's actually true. There's resume and restart. Um, you, can actually, uh, you can actually restart without the same message. You can restart with the same message. I think by default, uh, the, the message that caused you to fail actually is dropped and, and you get another one, but yeah, I don't... I think it, it goes into a failure um, mailbox, right? Yeah, yeah, yep. and you can you can you can use that message. You can respond to it, but uh, by default, I think it just restarts your actor. Yep. So, cool. Well, thanks for coming. Hope that was useful for you, and we'll be around if you have other questions. Thanks. <laughs>